Instagram. Instagram, Facebook, Anchor. Yeah, Facebook What's going in the house, on? Anchor in the house. We are. Happy set. Wednesday. It's already the middle of the week. Love it. This week's flying by. Let's let's talk about some fun, relevant information. If you guys are watching, for those of us in the industry, one of the things I know you're thinking about is what's up from the disruption side of the world. What other companies? So that, I want to talk about disruption for a second and the, dis, the difference between disruption and innovation. Yep. Right? So innovation is what you do to yourself. Yep. Disruption is what other people do to you. So what's happening is you've got a lot of people that are more reactive in, in their thinking, reactionary in their thinking in the industry. They're like, oh my God, what's coming in? This new model, this new model, this new model. And the fact is there's always new models. This time's a little different because these models that are coming in are way better funded and, wow, and streamlined in a very industry. strong yeah. uh, industry right now. Yep. So, um, Open Door is one of the interesting models. We just did a two hundred thirty-five million dollar um, second round raise today, and which is interesting to me because that that has a bigger bigger picture, right? And here's what it is from my perspective: muddiness in the industry, yeah, right? Commoditization in the industry, lack of differentiation is in the industry, the lack of perceived value is in the industry, which allows people to sit back and say, wait a second, let's look at this industry. There's billions of dollars being generated by these people. Yep. And I don't see much differentiation between them. So we should be able to wiggle ourselves in the middle and take a big piece of that pie, or a little piece of A little piece of a multi-billion dollar pie is a pretty nice piece of pie. Yep. Right. So that's kind of the big picture about what's going on, which you and I were just talking um, earlier today about what that actually means, right? Yeah. So what do we do from a brokerage perspective, from an agent perspective, from an industry perspective to sit back and first take stock and become brutally honest with ourselves as to how this happened, right? And then what do we do to change, right, and evolve and innovate on our own self? Because if we can't create the value from our own perception, how is a consumer ever going to see the value out there? Yeah, I mean, we, we did this to ourselves 100%. Now, you know, I think for, for practicality purposes, the concern, for me at least, is not even the VCs pumping money into the ecosystem because I think that that drastically changes if and when the market shifts. Most of the time, these things fail. My concern is that for anyone who realizes that, you're sitting back saying, ah, it probably won't work, right? It'll probably fail. What I think we need to be doing from a practicality standpoint is saying, what if it works, right? Because now that's a different mindset because that's a mindset where you have to start to innovate right. and stop trying to fight it because it's coming. They're going to keep pumping money into there until they figure it out, whether well, it's open door or... But you're using a word like it. Right, it's coming, figure it out. So let's talk about what it is because here's the major issue that I see with, with what everybody's doing, including the established brands, the independents, everybody in this industry right now. There are between 5 million and 5.4 million home sales a year, right? Somewhere in that range. That doesn't change because we have the same number of people basically, right? So everybody is chasing these 5 million transactions more or less. Yep. So it's not like the market size is growing to eight million this year, or nine million, or ten million. There's still going to be five million dollars worth five million home sales ballpark. Yeah. Right. So, every, what they're trying to do is everyone's trying to get a piece of that five million. So everybody can't have it. There's no way the billions of dollars that's being invested into this company are going to pay off for everybody. So I think what what they're looking to do is when you say doing it. Right, when they do it, it's it's coming. Right? Let's talk about what it is. What from what it is is creating a value proposition that resonates with the seller public, right? Yeah. And the buyer public. Because it's interesting interesting to me is a lot of people are chasing the buyer side. Yep. Because it seems to be the easier pool. Yeah. Because there's cloudiness in the buyer side like you wouldn't believe. We've got over a hundred about a hundred million internet leads flying into an industry that's resulting in five million sales. Yep. So that's 95 million pieces of junk that people are fighting over. 
to do so. True? Well, oh, a hundred percent. It's repetitive searches. It's, you know, multiple people, one person sending in multiple lead forms. You know, you do that across yeah. millions of people, then it results in all these bullshit leads. And then here's the, here's the bigger gut check for everybody in the industry right now. If you do your job correctly, right? Everybody who's had past sales, right? If you've sold a home before, these people that are trying to get into our industry, your industry, are pretty much out of luck if you do your job right. Because when you did a good job for Bob and Mary and you sold them a house over on Oak Street and you did a good job, you're solidified in their brain as the real estate professional who is, is top of mind. So it doesn't matter which company, which model comes out, if they trust you, if they know that you have their back, you did a good job and you're providing value, they're not going to go anywhere else. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. So where people have lost the ability to really monetize in this industry is by getting sloppy. So this is a wake-up call for anti-sloppiness, if you will, to say if you've got past clients, you better go own them. You better go talk to them. You better go pay attention and tell them they're pretty, yep. right? Or else they're gone. And they're gone completely and then shame on you for allowing that past lead to be done. Every new listing we get, is because another agent didn't do their job well. Yeah. Every listing anybody gets is because the agent that sold them the house did a bad job. Yeah. So let's let that awareness sink in for a second and step up our collective game to own the biggest asset that we have as an industry. I mean, we're part of um, Century 21, phenomenal brand, yep. which is with a phenomenal parent company, with Realogy, that's controlling more than a third of every real estate transaction in the country. That's a pretty nice market share. Right, biggest around, biggest in the industry. Yeah. So with that said, there should be only two thirds of the industry left at for grabs. But then you've got Berkshire Hathaway that says, "Hey, we're second. And then you've got Keller Williams, and then you got those type of companies that have their shares too. There should be no room, but there is because there's been a lack of differentiation and value out in the marketplace, and that's fixable. And that's what I think we can. Well, talk about I think today. I think the big the big opportunity in white space that all of these startups are trying to take advantage of is the fact that they are they're trying to do what Uber did for the, the driver. They're trying to make it easier, they're trying right. to simplify it, right? And and the reason being is for everything you just mentioned. We have I believe the brokerages and all of the franchises of those brokerages within each market have spent so much time trying to compete against each other and battle each other and oh we do this and they don't do that and we do this and they don't that they've actually lost sight of the fact that there's all these other people that are saying you guys are doing it so old school and fighting over things that people don't care about right. right you're fighting over all these things that the general public doesn't care about who's got the office count yeah. who's got a number of agents nobody gives yeah a no one cares yeah. no one cares and so at the end of the day what they're looking to do is say we're gonna slide in here, and we're gonna we're gonna bring value to people in that in stuff they care about, which primarily is time and ease, right? The perception so, of the it. perception, at least, and that's what Uber is. Uber doesn't actually save you time if you think about it, or money, or money. It's it's most of the case. It's a little bit more expensive, and it may not even be faster. But they did an excellent job of giving you the perception of time. Now, how do you fight it? Well, I can tell you, I recently read an article about a taxi driver in New York City who when he first heard about Uber years ago, he started filming himself and he, but he's very funny. So he would get people in the back of his cab and he would film them right. and like have interactions and he would post it on his social media. And he became a hit in his little area of New York that he worked. Okay. They did a follow-up article with him now that Uber is like fully going and yeah. you know, it's basically taking over New York City. He's still one of the most successful and widely used taxi drivers in that area, primarily because he's become, he's built so much value and brand yeah. in that area that even Uber can't touch him. He's the go-to. Right. He he's the go-to guy. He owns that because they want to go in his cab, right? So that's what brand is. Brand is making someone do something that without asking for it. That's what it is, right? This it's about an experience. Right. But this... When's the last time Apple ran an ad on Facebook to you and said, hey, click this button and come buy the iPhone? They don't. Right. Right? Yet we all still own an iPhone. 
it's get that's all brand is when you can get someone to want to do business with you that's brand and so as an agent because that's primarily who's watching us what i want to focus on now is how do we help them do that concept how do we help them build brand so that no matter how much money open door raises whether it works whether it doesn't whether it's knock whether it's Zillow's new instant offer, no matter what it is, because there's a million different things out there, they're gonna throw a bunch of crap on the wall and see what sticks, and eventually something's gonna stick. But no matter what it is, how, how do we teach an agent to build enough brand in their marketplace that allows them to still live and be successful? I think it's, it's an interesting point because they're trying, you said, let's see what sticks, right? You, as an agent watching right now, already have stuff that's sticking. Because if you've done deals already, you've already won. Because yep. you've already captured the customer that people are just now trying to attract. So the biggest asset base we have is the past customers in your database, right? And your sphere, and your natural market, and people that you touch that actually think favorably of you, that trust you, and know that you got their back. That's yep. really the ultimate thing. So you already own that brand. When I say brand, I'm not talking about C21 or KW or Remax. That, that's that's irrelevant. Then we'll talk about that later. That's a logic stack that builds behind you as the brand of the emotional tie and connection to that client. So it's if you're going to be in this industry, I don't. If, if you're new, great. If you're experienced, great. If you're at a level doing 50 deals a year, great. Right. You're at your baseline though. Right. If you're doing 50 deals a year and you have the desire to get to 75, you're just like a brand new agent that's doing nothing that's trying to get to 25. So let that sink in for a second because you have to do things differently than you've ever done to get the results that you're gonna want. Right, so how do you do that? So let's let's be self-aware enough to not bullshit ourselves, to think that things aren't the way that they are. Right, so, yeah. so let's understand that. So you have to talk to people to portray trust. 100%. Right? That is your, your 100% value proposition that's it is do you provide value and by value it's either do they perceive you're going to bring them the most amount of money or do they perceive that you're going to give them the best time and the efficiency and ultimately can they trust you right yep. so that's it so if you have a group of people that trust you and like you already you're already probably at a level of production that if it's comfortable for you Fantastic, love those people, coddle those people, you're gonna have a continual base of referral business. Yep. But you're probably not gonna to get to that next level without doing something different, which means you're gonna to have to reach out and earn trust of different people. So I talk to a lot of agents, we've got several hundred ourselves, that are happy doing 20, 30, 40, 50 deals with a nice lifestyle, but they'd like to maybe raise their price point. Yep. Right? They'd like to get into the million plus price point. They'd like to get into the waterfront neighborhoods, they'd like the nice golf course communities, rather than the different price points they're in. So let's talk about how would you bring value to a seller in a market that you're not in, which is relevant to new and experience at whatever level that you're in. So how do you do that? Because it's cluttered space, because I was at a meeting earlier today with Craig, and we were at a lunch breakout, we were talking to this guy who's not in our industry at all, and we were having conversations about, he was considering selling his house, right? And I said, what is the differentiation point for you, right? How are you gonna select who you're going to hire next, right? Mm -hmm. And is it an agent? Is it a company? Is it a postcard? Is it a sign? And he he actually hadn't thought about that. I'm just saying, no. I, I really don't know. Who should I? How do I pick a good agent? And that was the question he talked about. And it's an interesting question. How does a seller think about a poor seller? First of all, let's walk this back for a second. Let's say you and Courtney decided to sell your house. Yep. And first of all, let's back up to what happened before that point happened you guys kicked around the idea of moving and inside you're like shit i don't want to move the kids have their friends in the neighborhood we're so used to our dry cleaner we we, we like the neighborhood everything's fine now we're going to disrupt our lives and move do we really want to do this yep and you're going to resist it in every chance you can and say you know the kitchen sucks but it's okay honey right mm -hmm. it would be nice to have another office but we can make do because you yep. don't want to reach that pain point no so know, yeah but sucks. if you get surprised tonight and you've got twins waiting for you you're gonna have no choice but to, to do something yeah so you're gonna resist as long as you can and she's gonna ultimately say new house now yep and you're gonna say all right and then you're gonna take a millisecond this is really what happens you're gonna blink mm -hmm. and your brain's gonna sort into your head and you're gonna say who should I hire and you're gonna go through a filing cabinet that's in your brain 
and you're going to say, do I know anybody? Yep. And you're going to see, sort, real quickly, your brain's going to sort, postcards, signs, right, newspaper ads, TV commercials, this, that, and the other, my friend Joe, this Barbara, all these things are going to kind of float around in your brain, and you're going to scratch your head and say, who do I choose? Isn't this really what happens? No, it's 100% what happened. And the last time we did this, right, the, it just so happened that a good friend of mine okay. had just been posting on Facebook because he had just became an agent, okay. right? So he had been telling everyone and, and doing his job of putting it out there. When he first said it two weeks prior, I really didn't care, right? Right? I hadn't I hadn't gone there mentally yet, so it didn't, it didn't resonate with me at all. I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. The real estate agent now, right? You didn't think twice about it. Kept putting stuff out there. Just kept skipping by it. Yeah. The minute that changed, I was like, oh, yeah, Derek's, Derek's in real estate. Let me call him, right? And now. But, but why did you do that? Let's dissect that process. What, what happened in your brain? You, it's something you didn't want to do. I didn't want to do it. Okay. Right? At all. But now that I made up my mind that I had to do it, I wanted the, the quickest fastest, easiest way to easiest handle. Easiest, comfort zone. Yeah, oh yeah. And I'd known Derek since I was 13, right? So there was trust built. He's not gonna he judge wasn't, Yeah, he wasn't gonna purposely kill me, stuff, right? right? Um, he had been in the house uh, hundreds of times, okay. right? So I knew he knew the house. Um, and, you know, it's funny, looking back now, I'm like, well, I probably should have interviewed a few people. Right, right. <laughs> probably should have asked him some, some better questions. But the reality is, my mind was in such a different place that the trust he had built by being a friend and then by letting me know what he was up to and that he was in real estate and he was putting it out there, yeah. all of that combined just said, hey, he's an easiest option, let him do his thing, don't second guess it, you know, kind of thing. All right, so roll that, bundle all that up into one word and I think it's the T word. It's trust, it's trust. 100%. Right, and if you didn't know Derek, you mm -hmm. would have had to search a little bit deeper in your brain and then you and Courtney would have had a conversation saying, do you know anyone? Who do you know? Oh yeah, for and sure. And then today and that, you might and do a post starts. and say, hey, we're moving, who do you know? And or if you're, you've got a friend, every one of us has a friend who just moved or is moving and had an well, experience. Well, and I would before. argue with, his, with the number of real estate agents just in the state of Florida, every one of us through a friend or family member has a friend or family member oh, yeah. that's in real that's estate, you have a driver's right? license and a real estate license. But the vulnerability <laughs> is, so Derek, Derek's vulnerability during that time period would have been if he was a real estate agent and was my friend, but was not actively telling me that he was in real estate and somebody else was, then he was at a, a risk, yeah. right? That was a vulnerability point for him where he very easily could have lost me to them even though he's my friend, if this person's telling me every day that they're in real estate, they would have popped into my head, probably yeah. not him, right? So timing's everything, but the reality is you don't know someone's timing. So what and Derek, you can't right, so what Derek was doing was just putting himself out there every day, right? Knowing that the timing wasn't right for me when he was doing it, he could have stopped, he could have said, no one's paying attention. But he didn't care. But he didn't care, he just kept putting it out and then, it happened to be that timing did was right. And so you never know when that timing's going to be, which is why every agent listening, you have to be posting content, not, hey, I'm a realtor, hey, I'm a realtor every day, but showing and building that you're the expert every single day. All right, let's, let's pause there for a second, because there's, there's a lot of people will watch this and say, screw that, I'm not doing it. I'm not a Facebooker, I'm not an Instagrammer, it's just not gonna happen, I'm not snapping either, right? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do whatever I'm gonna do, which is fine, so let, let's reframe that, that statement. You have to enter their brain, right? Yep. Somehow, because let's say you're so anti this, let's say you still have a flip phone, right? And you're like, I'm not touching it, I'm resisting, I am not gonna ever go on Facebook for the rest of my life, I'm just that kind of cool guy. You're gonna go out right? of business. So you may go out of business. <laughs> you but will it, go out of business. So you're going to have a harder business, but that's not, that's okay. not necessarily right. true. I, okay? I, here's, I, won't, here's why. I won't downplay that. But here's why. Because I could, if, if you're a flip phoner, you could still survive in this business. It's just different because you're going to have to...
do it the old fashioned way. You're gonna go knock, 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 and you're gonna go banging on doors and you're gonna have to get, capture somebody's eyeballs and you're gonna have to say, please let me earn your trust. I'm good at what I do. Is there any shot you're thinking about selling your house, right? Of course, we can have more elaborate scripts on that, but that's the core basic. And they might say, screw you. You go to the next door, knock, 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 knock. Hi, I'm Jeff. Please trust me. I'm good at what I do. Do you want to sell your house? Right? If you're going to go knock on 100 doors a day, it's impossible not to find somebody who will give you a shot. The blind squirrel finds a nut. That will work. Right? And yep. this, we talked about this the other day, too. The everything works is the worst part about this industry. Or, let's go to number two. You can go knock on every... There's 300 for sale by owners and anybody who's watching Marketplace right now. You could spend the next month Go into every one of those 300 people, never opening up Facebook ever, and saying, hi, please trust me, give me a shot to sell your house. Right? And that could work. You can go to every expired listing and do the exact same thing, and it will end up working. Now, that's you could open up the phone book if you can find one. <laughs> you can go to whitepages.com and print out some streets and dial. I mean, every one of these will work. You can get a park no. bench on every corner I, I and make think, people think about you. But so think, everything works. I think we need to define the works right because i agree in that that you can go do some deals that way what i would argue is if you are see and, and this is the challenge i have you absolutely don't need to do social media at all if you're okay doing less deals overall in a year because i would argue that if you have someone who's building brand on facebook every day not spamming people, but truly building brand, bringing value, posting video content, working with renters and posting content that's up with them and really building their brand. That they, especially over a three year period, will do far more volume and have the ability to do far more volume than someone who's out knocking on doors. So the problem I have is people's ambitions do not map to their mouth. Right? So what they say and their work effort. So what they say they're going to do or they want to do, they say they want to do you know, a $300,000 commission year, but in reality, they don't want to touch social media. And I just don't see a way where you can physically go out and knock on enough doors and build enough brand. Because how do you follow uh, up? Well, let, let me, let's cause that. You don't, and here's the thing. So you will not build a brand Right. And you will not follow up. But you can be that bull in the china shop, brute force agent. I know, because I did this, right, before social media was even a big thing. Yeah. Right? So forget brand, forget repeat referral business. You can go full throttle and bang on doors and say, you want to sell your house 400 times a day. You will get, you will make 300,000 bucks this year. The problem is you're starting at zero next year. Right, because you got to do the same yeah, thing again. No with no there's, there's no follow-up. No, there's no way. To but keep. it's okay. But that, there's probably seventy percent of the agents are not. Probably ninety percent of the agents industry wide are not thinking three years from now brand. They're thinking about commission check now, right? And so that's the disconnect about the how do we build the. I don't care about building my brand and my business. I need to get a commission check which that's a major fatal flaw in the industry, but the reality is a lot of people are operating that way. So they're like, I, yeah, I, I get it, I get the brand, but let me go bang on, let me go get a deal. But let me go get a buyer. I understood, but let's get practical then, right? So the, again, this circles back to practicality. Everyone has bills, everyone has things that they have to do. It's life, right? No, no question. And for an agent first starting out, building a brand for three years from now sounds great in theory, but they need to eat mm -hmm. today, so they're they're focused on that. I would argue then that you are creating a framework that is never going to allow you to be successful in three or five years, and every day you're going to be questioning how you're going to eat tomorrow with that you're attitude. Right, one hundred percent. So the only way to fix that and create a framework that does allow you to think three years out and give you the ability to be patient is to a make sure your lifestyle is simple enough where you don't have those stresses yet, right? right? Or at least less stress. And be practical. There's so many things you could do to pay the bills. Uber, go be an Uber driver, right? Yeah. Drive for three hours a day. Work 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day, right? Sleep, sleep a little less. Get up earlier. 
They, like, they, there's okay. always something. Go garage selling. Go garage selling. Go buy old shit. Go, go do what the Dollar Shave Club guy did. Go buy shit at the dollar store, right? right. And turn around and sell it on eBay for five but or let, four. Let, let's like, go that's back That's practical, though. Like, you need to stop complaining about not being able to pay your bills. Go do something that allows you, gives you enough dollars to be able to cover your expense that allows you then, big picture, to build a brand because you will never be successful in this industry or any industry for that matter if you do not create a framework that allows you to look at a big window and build brand, especially with the way the world is changing. I we think it's that. disruptive now. Wait for wait for the next 24, 36 months. Here's the interesting thing that none of that matters, right? None of, none of what anybody else is doing matters. Your business plan is the only thing that matters because it is because you can control it. So let me let's flip the the script on that for a second. Let's say if you're an agent and you say I need money mm -hmm. and I'm going to go bartend at wherever Outback and you think that few hundred bucks a month, a week is going to change your world. I'm going to argue that that is a dumb idea because the way that this business can't, the way that this, if you're absolutely committed to making money, earning money, providing value by providing value to this industry, you can go get a deal. And here's, there's, there's companies out there that will factor your commission check. So you can bust your ass right now all week long, exhaust yourself, start early, stay late, Get a listing, price it right, it'll go under contract in this marketplace right now and within a week, right? And it's going to go under contract and then you can go to the commission advance places and you can get five grand, right? You're not going to be able to wait enough tables to match that five grand in this three weeks I, time period. I agree. So I think the business model is flawed in the thinking about long-term income. So there's short-term abilities to go get some money if we can provide value. So we'll get back I, to that in a second. I, well, I agree with you. I, I, so I was using the other stuff as an example, but I agree with you. Here's, here's my thought on that, though. If, you're going, if you need that immediate income, then 20% of your action need to be, how do I get a deal right now? Let me, let me write hook right now. And 80% needs to be thinking about building the brand long-term because if not, I promise you it will snowball into it into a very negative place for you business wise but here's the thing you all that means is you need to work harder right if you need money now and it's causing you to be less patient because here's the thing anytime you right hook something I don't care who you are if you go out tomorrow right let's just use this example it's all scale right you go out tomorrow and you decide I'm gonna buy a Ferrari Right? right? I've got money in the bank, I'm gonna buy a Ferrari. Right. You buying that Ferrari makes you less liquid. Yeah. And then if tomorrow someone came to you and said, hey, Jeff, I've got this investment that's 200 grand and it's awesome. And you looked at it and said, shit, yeah. I'm less liquid. I can't do right. that deal, right? Every choice that you make has a reaction. Every time you buy something, every time you take away from being patient, you limit yourself in some way, shape, or form. You're creating a framework that yeah. does not allow you to be successful in the next day. So I just think that if you need to make money now, right to your point, then I would say use Facebook to build your brand and go door knock, all right? Okay. Yeah. Like that to me, like there's no excuse. So then all that means is you need to do more. You, you need, need to do, do a bunch of activity that gets you business now, and you need to be thinking, how do, what do I do to create value long term? Well, let, let's talk about the most valuable things you can do right now. If you needed business, or you just wanted to challenge yourself to see if you can, right? Depending on what level you're at, just to, to have some fun. I think you can aggressively use social media. Right? Yep. I think a lot of people think it's a, as a passive long term play. Nope. There's an aggressive aspect to Facebook. Well, and that, that's Instagram what paid ads are for. Facebook right? and then hand-to-hand hand hey, hey, comment through Messenger yeah. and all the other Oh yeah, I mean, there, there are ways to grassroot prospect right now, go search your network, go, go use a search bar, you know, search looking for a house, look at the posts, yeah. you're going to see a bunch of posts of people looking hashtag for homes, moving. right? Yeah. Any, or go on Instagram, hashtag moving, hashtag moving to Florida is a yeah. hashtag, um, hashtag my husband got a new job, right? Like, yeah. it doesn't matter what it is. Just figure out those hashtags and, and yeah. go go message each of those people, yeah. right? Um, paid ads, 
front of the paid ad for five dollars a day. You'll get in front of people and you can right hook them there. Or so, bang on doors. Or bang on doors or go get but but the point is that if if you're need business right now to your point, it will work. Go bang on doors, go knock on doors. But just because you're out knocking on four hundred doors does not mean that you have an excuse of why you're not also building a brand on Facebook. Because if you're knocking on 400 doors, you're gonna see probably 65 people, right? Or maybe 100 and something. Maybe. People. And it took you all freaking day, two days to knock on 400 doors. Uh -huh. And in that same time period, you could have reached thousands and thousands of people in the air conditioning in July in Florida is a way. Yeah, I mean, Florida. Jessica told me today that the last video she posted got thirteen hundred over thirteen hundred views in three days. Okay, there you How go. in the world so would she have ever talk to thirteen hundred people? So you know, I think I just think that, that patience is an issue for everyone, and and it's life that causes us to become impatient. And I get it. Um, you know, hell, when a Ferrari drives by, I want one too. But I just constantly remind myself that 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 will result in you being less liquid which will result in you not being able to do something potentially that you want to do and so at the end of the day if you if you can do two deals a year make 30 grand or 10 four deals whatever make 30 grand six deals make 30 grand a year and you're happy right and you're you're covering everything and you're good and you're not complaining and life's great good good for you but if you're one of those people that's out there that's new or that's doing four deals and you want to do eight and you want to do 10 or 50, up to or, 80. 50 or, or 80, you have to work harder. Like that's, that's just it. Like if you want to do more, you have to work more. It, it, like they, it, now, you can always work smarter, but I would argue then you should be working smarter and harder. Okay. Like, so so let's, let's, let's move, move past the, to the, uh, the next topic here is I found somebody. Okay, yeah, you got, some, you got someone I, to say yes, you're sitting across from them. Somebody said, I'm thinking about it. Because let's be realistic about how this works. Again, resistance. Nobody wants to move. They get to the realization that they have to. And they're like, shit, I have to move. What am I going to do? So they finally let somebody they can trust, which hopefully is you, into their living room. And then you're sitting there. What's the point? What do you have to do? Now, I'm, I'm, forget about presentations. That's would do that a whole another different broadcast, right? What's the ultimate goal? What do you have to portray to that person? What's the, what is it? What is the one value thing? and trust? Value and trust. Okay. So the, and then there's there's two levels here. You've got the emotional play, and let, let me let me back up. There's only one play, and it's the emotional play. Do they feel in their true heart that your best interest, right? You have their best interest in heart, because the moment it becomes about you, they've already disconnected and they're ready to kick you out. Yep. Right? So it's one thing, one thing, and it's the emotional connection. How do you build the emotional connection with a client? And let's say it's your friend, Derek, right? You've got to think about Derek as the non-beer drinking buffoon for which you know Derek to be and as worthy of hearing, handling the largest financial transaction in your life, which is a tough, tough leap. Right. Yep. At some level, you've got pictures in your brain oh, of why he sure. should not have been trusted. Oh, with he that definitely outcome. probably shouldn't yeah. have been at times. So but. that, so with your sphere and the people that you know, the biggest issue you have to do is change it. So you've got two of the three major points checked. The box is checked, and there's three of them. It's can I trust you? Are you good at what you do? And do you care about me? And the people that you already know already trust you and know that you care about them. They just don't know if you're good at what you do. Right. right? So that's where the right company, the right backing, the right encouragement, education comes into play, but it's only one third of the equation. So you're gonna win two thirds of the time just by being a good person and by capitalizing on the asset you've been building your whole lifetime. But somewhere in their brain, there's gonna be a question mark as to, but are they good, right? Should I trust him? Whether it's subconscious or conscious or vocalized or not, that question is going to be out there. So how do you, right, watching, how do you give or listening, how do you portray the realness of your passion and your trust, worthiness, and your ability to be chosen, right? So let's talk about how, how we train that. Yep. Okay. It's huge. This is scary, right? How long do you think? For those watching, think about this one. How long do you think it takes for somebody to decide to work with you or not? Right? How long do you really think it's going to take? You have 
seven seconds and you either got the deal or you blew it. It's seven. And for those of you working the phone, you got three, right? So seven to 15 seconds maximum is the time that you have to get the deal. Anything after that is all just fluff and it's just pomp and circumstance after the fact. So the, the meat of this game is the first seven to 15 seconds of meeting him. So what do I mean by that? Because here's the, here's the thing, the value is trust and trust is comfort, mm -hmm. okay? And the only way to generate comfort is to make sure that they trust you, okay? So I'm going very fundamental basics here, but it's extremely important because it's probably the most advanced basic aspects in, in life, not just real estate. So it's trust. And here's how things work. When the moment you're born, you are picked up shortly thereafter by somebody, okay? And they hold you at some level and you start to see that person on a regular basis. Okay. Yep. And I'll, I'll make this story shorter than this, right? So, but you've got these people that are going to take you into their arms and their heart and their, hopefully, and their, their life, and they're going to raise you. Yep. And you're going to be raised by that person or people, mother, father, grandmother, cousin, uncle, teacher, neighbor, right? Everybody who's formative in your formative years is developing you as a person and they are teaching you how to be you. And you don't know how to be you. You're born with a blob. You don't do shit. Yeah. Right, and then you start to learn how to look and talk and speak and laugh, and you listen to certain types of music and you speak a different type of language, and you see what's appropriate eye contact. You know how to shake hands. You, you know, is it nice to? Where's your personal space boundaries? What is the? How is? What's morals? What are ethics? What's questionable? What's not questionable? What's too late to call somebody? What's appropriate? What's too early to go see somebody? What? You know, all these things of life lessons mold you into a person. Yep. And that becomes the number one aspect of your life, which is you. And the only person you trust in this world ultimately is you, right? You are the one person in this world that you trust more than anybody else in this world. Because you know from a primitive nature of your brain, you're less likely to hurt you than anybody else on this planet. So that's it. So your perfect world in life is for you to find other people that are just like you throughout your life. Yep. Okay. And therefore, you're going to find only people that you trust and you like, and it's a happy-go-lucky holding hands, skipping down the unicorn lane, right? But unfortunately, that's not the way life is, because every person you meet was raised by somebody else and was taught a different set of ethics and morals and values and music and religions and all these different things that are, all of them are right, none of them are wrong, they just are. So now you, here you are, plopped into this world, surrounded by billions of people that have their own sense of reality and they all believe that's right. Yep. Right. So now here you are in the living room of one or two or three people who were raised however the hell they were raised, who only trust themselves. And now you're a stranger. I don't care if you know them from Facebook or not, you're still not them. Right. Right. So there's an, a level of inherent distrust, even though there's a little bit of trust, but you still have to prove that you're the right person for this job. Yep. Right? The largest financial transaction in most people's lives, or at least one of them. So let's call out everything and let's be real for a second. This is the value proposition of this industry. Are you the right person for me to put in your hands the handling of one of the largest financial assets in my life, knowing that you have 63 hours of education in order to get a license to do so, and you might know what not know what the hell you're doing, right? It's frightening. Right? So all of that stuff creates the doubt, the fear, and the anxiety in agents because now it's probably going to be worse for you, sorry, but you're going to be sitting there looking at a potential seller knowing that all they're doing is figuring out how they can get away from you because they don't trust you. Right. So now your job is not to say, I'm on 800 websites and I have bigger offices and I have this many agents and this is my ranking. They only gives a shit. Nope. Right? The issue is at the core, let me look in your eyes and can I trust you? Right? And they're not going to come out and actually say that, but that's the only question they're really wondering in their mind. So the value proposition is how can I, as an agent, and I use that word seriously too, because I hope you have an agency relationship where you actually legally can represent somebody. If you don't, how do you fake the ability to take care of somebody when you legally can't? Right? It, just, it doesn't make sense to me. So how can you, as a agent, in a fiduciary role, sit across from somebody and tell them that I've got your back, right? 
I don't care about price per square foot. I don't care about days on the market. None of that's necessary right now. Nope. The issue at its core foundation is can I trust you, right? You give me your trust, I've got your back. So how do you build it? So now you've got to step back and say, all right, let me leave myself for a little while and let me stop be in my ego world, put it into neutral, we call it all the time, law of neutrality, and just say, what's going on in your world? Let me actually enter your world for a little while. Let me be so selfless and let me be so caring and customer service driven that I care about you so much that I have so much empathy that I really want to know what's going on in your world and how can I relate to you in such a way that you feel the most comfortable. And that goes back to me respecting the way you were raised and the way you were brought up and the way that you trust and see the world. Yep. So if you sit back like this, I'm going to sit back like this. You're doing this, I'm going to do it. It's, it's, it's all of the things that we teach from a fundamental core level of how do you build that connection. Because if you don't have a connection, you're out of freaking business. Yep. And I don't give a shit how much more money you raise on Wall Street nope. because an algorithm doesn't do that. Right? Yeah. So if you're going to create value and grow your business, you need to figure out how to create the value, create the trust, get in their eyes, and let them know for sure that it's 100% about them and you've got their back. Now that's the emotional connection. That is the, that's the bond. That's the connection. I don't give a shit what company you work for. No. Okay? That yet. Okay? This is the connection. It's the, I trust you, I like you, I don't know what it is about you, but I feel comfortable with you. Then, inside their brain, they're gonna peek behind you, right? In their mind at least. And they're gonna say, I like the guy or the girl. Is she capable of handling this deal, right? And they might not vocalize this, but that's, that's when the rest of it matters. That's when the brand matters. Yep. That's when the market share matters. That's when the websites matter. That's when the global translation team matters. That's when the YouTube videos matter. That's when all of the metric systems and the global presences and all that other stuff matters, right? And it absolutely matters because if they're going to trust you and they want you to deliver the highest price possible in the marketplace, if you don't have systems and tools to do that and actually articulate it, why the hell are they going to give you the deal? They like you, but now they don't have any real meat behind that on that bone look at your offering package and your company package and your brand package and say is this attractive because they like me they trust me and and I have all of this right that's yeah. the secret to creating value and getting business in, in, in this marketplace in any marketplace today well and I to your point I think the brand behind you brings value at that point I think going back to you know obviously you replicating them and, and kind of mirroring them is going to help with the trust. But the questions you're asking, the words that are coming out of your mouth mm -hmm. matter just as much because the way I look at this is in those first, that first half, your personal brand and the value you're personally bringing matters. Yep. Then once they decide they like you, then it's the brand behind you and that brand. Right. The, the things that build the Century 21 and Begging's brand are drastically different than how you build your brand. Yep. The Beggins brand and the Century 21 brand is built on, you know, history, number of transactions, you know, the proof in the marketplace. That's that's our brand, right? The agent's brand, though, no matter who you're with, is the value that you can bring and your ability to actually care, right? So I'll give you an example. When I was selling my home, obviously a lot going on. We ended up selling our house very quickly. We listed like Sunday night. By Monday, we had five showings. We had full, five full price offers made on Tuesday, and one of them was all cash, which was obviously the one we wanted to take. The disadvantage to that was, hey, by the way, you guys need to be out in seven days is when the guy yeah. wanted to close. I'm like, well, we haven't even looked at house yet, yeah. right? Like, we knew what we wanted, but we hadn't even really looked. And so, one of the issues that came up immediately was a, an issue with our AC. And the, the reason that I know that I made the right decision with the agent that I, that I did was from minute one when he sat down with us, and obviously I knew Derek, but he said, listen, I know you guys have all this going on. I know you have to go look you know, for a house and there's, you know, you're starting a new job. There's so many questions. You worry about that. Anything that comes up with the house, I'll take care of, right? Yeah. So the AC issue comes up. So that was him building trust, but his brand and his follow-up was AC issue comes up. He calls me and says, hey, we got an AC issue. Don't worry. 
you just do your thing. I'll let you know what's up, right? But I'm gonna call the AC guy out. I'm gonna get him out there. I'm gonna meet him at the house. We're gonna get it all. And he took care of all of it. I didn't show up. He got it straightened out. We went home shopping and we took care of the move yeah. while he did everything over here. So I think- And he never forgot that. And I never forgot it. So I think the bottom line is you have to be the resource. When you sit in front of them in that first little bit and learn about what their situation is, your questions need to be around that. Oh, you're you're having you're worried about an electrical issue. You know what? I know an electrician. You want me to call him for you? Like we'll get him out here right now. Oh, you need help moving? You need moving boxes? Oh, I got moving boxes. Right. Like those are all things that are you become a resource, and that's how you're building your personal brand. And that stuff matters so much. It really does. You're right. Here's here's one thing that you mentioned that I think gets overlooked a lot on this one because we talk about connecting and reaching out to people and. It's a big thing, but let's talk about how communication actually happens, right? There's, take a pie chart in your brain and 7% of it, 38% of it, 55% of it. Imagine you get a big old circle on your contract I was helping an agent with, but you picture a pie chart. 7% of it is words, that's it. The other 93% of all communication is completely nonverbal. Think about that for a second. Only 7% of the words, 93% is nonverbal. And where trust is built is nonverbal. It has nothing to do with the words. It has some, everything to do with how the words are rolled out, mm -hmm. the sincerity behind those words, and the relevance to the words to their world, right? Yep. So here's where 98% of the agents fail and blow out of this business. They don't know the words, right? So when they're connecting with the client, they're sitting there going, thinking about what they're gonna say next, right? What's the magic, what's the right thing to say? How do I say it? What's my thing? What's my words? And they don't know their presentations. They don't know the scripts. They don't know the relevant talking tracks. I don't care what you call it, but you don't know your trade, yeah. right? And if you don't know your trade, you're constantly gonna be worrying about what words you're saying. And then when you're worrying about the words you're saying, your client's looking at you like your blank stare because there's nothing real behind you because you're worried about words and you're not worrying about connecting. So that's why most agents don't get a connection and they don't get much business because the clients ghost on them because they didn't feel the connection and they weren't real. So that's why we spend a lot of energy right, training the way that we train so the words can become internalized because when you can go on autopilot and you don't have to worry about the words, you can now spend all of your time focusing and connecting on what's going on with the client you're actually talking to because right? that makes the big difference on on how this actually works. So that's it. If you're not connecting at the level, if you're not producing at the level which you know you should be, I want you to do an internal audit self gut check right now. And if I said, come over and do your listing presentation to me right now, could you do it? Right now, not tomorrow, right now. Yep. And if I said, I wanna buy a house, do you have a presentation that you go through? Do you have a process that you go through? If I said, what's my home worth? Do you know how to handle that? Where's your pre-qualification script? Where's your strategic pricing analysis? Where's your seller's cost estimator? How do you go through timing of the marketplace? How do you run your business? Because if you're not running your business like a business and you don't have these things in place, you're gonna be running loosey-goosey and their spidey senses, if you will, are gonna say, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't trust you because you don't seem competent yep. and you don't seem confident. And they will never vocalize that no. But it'll be that, you know what, thanks for coming over. We're going to think about it and we'll call you later. Lost, fail, done. Yep. Okay? Yeah. And that's, I mean, guys, this business is a business and it's a profession, right? What's the difference between an amateur and a professional? Right? Two things, right? Let's take golf. An amateur golfer versus a professional golfer. What's the difference in those two people? One gets paid. One gets paid. And what's the other difference? One's better than the other. Why is one better than the other? Because they practice. Yeah. And they practice and they practice and they practice. Somebody goes around to pound some beers and smack a golf ball around on the weekends. Great, have fun. But you're not gonna. I'm not gonna see you at Augusta, right? I remember I've been the good fortune to go to Augusta several times now. And one of the first time I was there was when Tiger Woods um, just bogeyed half the holes, and it, it was ridiculous because I got there early on purpose to watch the. Watch him, right? Part of the, right? Yeah, of course. And first thing in the morning, who's on the practice group? Right? Who's in the tee? Tiger Woods. Yeah. Right. After he fucking had a great day, who's there smacking balls around at the end of the day? 
Yep. Neither was. He was there every morning, every night, every morning. Every, there's no correlation. Now, not totally relevant right this second, but it's at the top of his game, arguably one of the best in the world ever professionally. We won't talk personally. Right? But that's the difference. So if you're an agent, are you an amateur agent? Or are you a professional agent? Professionals, agents in this business are making deep six figures, seven figures. Right? Amateurs are just screwing around doing three, four, five, six deals a year. And that's amateur. And at some point in this industry, amateurs will be knocked out. And that's what a lot of the disruptors look into and say, why is Susie Smith, right? Sorry yeah. if your name's Susie Smith, that was a hypothetical name. Why is Susie Smith in this industry? Look, she does three deals a year. She makes 12 grand and she sits around doing shit, yep. right? That's the person that's gonna be knocked out of this industry. When you're a professional yep. and you're gonna treat it seriously and you're gonna treat people well and connect with them, you're not going anywhere. I don't care who comes into the marketplace. No. But if you want to be better, right, if you want to be the best, then you have to put in the work. I remember I recently watched a thing on Jerry Rice, arguably the best wide receiver to ever play football, right? And one of his teammates said the most amazing thing ever was that the year after they won the Super Bowl, they, he came in to clean out his locker, right? And he sees Jerry Rice out on the field running sprints. Yeah. Season didn't start for months. Yeah. This was literally like three, four days after they just won the Super Bowl and Jerry Rice is out there running sprints again. Yeah. Like there's just people that work at a different level. So if you're one that's those words are coming out of your mouth, that you want to be the number one agent, I don't care what brokerage you're at, that you wanna, you know, do a million dollars a year, you can. And commissions, not sales. And commissions, yes. <laughs> and commissions. You can, but you're gonna to have to put in the work to do it. And if you're not going to put in that work, just be self-aware enough to know you're not and be happy with where you think you can get and the work that you can get. Again, it's all it's all relative to you, but if you're complaining that you're not at where you want to be, work harder, stop complaining. Like that's the best advice. And accept I it. Give you. Accept yeah. that you're getting what you And just are understand. Into yeah, it. just understand that. And understand that you control it, right? You're in complete control. Now, let's leave them with something practical, piece of something that they can do. Um, I think for me, what I'll leave them with is, you know, uh, a mutual colleague of ours sent us a video today, and, and I didn't watch the entire thing, I watched most of it, but the concept is being done out in Arizona, and I love it, so I want to share it here, is that when you get a listing, have, you know, I, I push people to do video all the mm -hmm. time, right? Video, 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 video. This guy's having the seller do the video, so it's very professional. Instead of him doing an overview of the home and touring it, he's actually sitting down and interviewing the seller on why they bought it, what they loved about it, you know, what their kids loved about yeah. it, how close it was to the kids' school, telling their story, why they're moving, like everything. But I promise, I watched it and I fell in love with the home that she was selling because I got to know the story. I promise you, there are so many buyers that are out there wondering, they walk into a house and like, man, this is a beautiful house. Why is this person leaving? Right? Yeah. What's wrong with it? There's got to be something, yeah. right? That's going through their head, whether they ever say it or not. This was a great tactic and something that I think you could do on your next listing um, that will bring a lot of value. Sit your seller down, and, and it's not for every seller. Not every seller will want to be on camera. That's okay. It doesn't have to be every listing. Find the right listing. Put your seller in front of the camera, and just even if it's you with a phone or an iPad, Interview them. Say, hey, what did you love about the house? Why did you move here? How long ago did you move here? What, yeah. what did you do? What was your favorite part of the house? What did your kids love about it? What you know? What's the neighborhood like? Have them tell the story, yeah. right? It's their house. If you do it as the agent, you have something to gain, right? Yeah. So it's harder to trust that for being what it is. But if you actually have the seller do it, um, I think that's really powerful. My tactical takeaway is decide. Big time decision. Are you going to be an amateur? Or are you going to be a professional? Right? And pick one and live that. Right? And don't pretend you're going to be a professional if you're only going to do the work that an amateur does. Right? Be honest with yourself, but don't be pissed when you're not producing a ton of money, right, at the level of a professional when you're only acting like an amateur. So if you do not have the support and the system and the training and the guidance and the competence and the confidence to treat your career like a profession, then freaking move somewhere that will get you there, right? That's, that's the answer. Learn your trade, 
learn your presentations, learn your skills, learn your processes. And then when you're face to face with somebody, you can actually connect and behind you, they will feel the confidence. They know you know what you're doing. You, they know you know what you're talking about. They know that you're the person they can trust. But without you, with that professional skill, you're spinning your wheels, guys, you're wasting time. All right, hey guys, hope you're loving the content that we're doing, and if you do, um, click subscribe right here to get some more YouTube, and like us on Facebook, share us. Just please share, hit the share button, and let some other people know that you're digging what we're dropping. Yeah, and if you have a specific question, need anything at all, just uh, DM us on any of the channels, and we'll get right back to you on it. Love it, see ya.